Coach Jingguan Chen. Uh, good morning. So, we're at the halfway point of our conference. Just let everybody know things are going great, right? Uh, and also, we're really happy to see all the sessions with very active participation from the audience, very lively questions and answer period. So we really encourage that. But uh, it was brought to our attention there are a couple of incidences where the questions could be perceived as a bit over aggressive, right? So I just want to remind people to be kind and to be polite. And if you really have some, uh, you know, constructive criticism, the best venue will be, you know, talking to the individuals during the break. So again, uh, just remind everybody code of conduct for the. Uh, let's make this a high pay and place for everyone. So uh, let's continue our great. Uh, Final lectures, but first let me introduce the honorary chair, Gary Haller, please. Yeah. I think we have a couple slides about the Budar Award before I begin. We'll give you a few seconds here to read. And the next slide. So uh, Michel Boudard was perhaps the premier scholar in heterogeneous catalysis in the 20th century. He was also a bridge between the European origin of catalysis and the American evolution of the catalysis. With an academic lineage that goes through Sir Hugh Taylor back to Arrhenius and Bodenstein, that is, to the origins of physical chemistry, and chemical kinetics, respectively. Thus, it's fitting that the Michel Boudard Award for the Advancements of Catalysis is administered jointly by the North American Catalysis Society and the European Federation of Catalysis Societies, and it is sponsored by the uh, Halder Topso Company. The award consists of a plaque or a object of art at a prize of $6,000. The award recognizes and encourages individual contributions to the elucidation of mechanisms of active sites uh, involved in catalytic phenomena and to the development of new methods and concepts that advance the understanding and practice of heter heterogeneous catalysis. The 2023 award and the ninth recipient of the Budad Award is Professor Johannes Lercher. Uh, I would say about him that uh, early on I was his mentor, and now in my old age he's my mentor and a close friend, and he will be introduced by his colleague at the Pacific Northwest uh, uh, National Laboratory, Yang Wang. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm greatly honored to introduce Professor Johannes Lecher, a distinguished scholar and a contemporary pioneer in catalysis, renowned for bridging between fundamental concepts and practical applications. Professor Lecher is at the front, forefront of catalysis research, leading two highly accomplished research groups at the Institute for Integrated Catalysis of Pacific Northwest National Library and the Technical University of Munich. With unwavering commitment, Professor Lecher tackles the most challenging issues in catalysis. 
His work spans from uh, the exploration of uh, crucial functions of uh, porous environments within zeolites in catalytic process to decoding the kinetic influence of solvents, notably water, on active centers. The insight from these studies has shown paths to adjust the thermodynamic properties of reacting molecules along the transformation pathways to enhance the activity and the selectivity of a catalyst. This approach is highly valuable in addressing challenges like biomass conversion, plastic upcycling, and the decarbonization using electrochemical approach. With a, an impressive 700 publications, Johannes has received numerous awards in the field of catalysis and uh, has been recognized by six prestigious academies. Beyond his research and the dedication to training students, uh, Johannes has shown exemplary services to the catalyst community, including serving as the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Catalysis for over a decade. From a personal side, I'm uh, incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to have worked alongside uh, with Johannes for the past 12 years at uh, PNL. Uh, I think all my colleagues at PNL will agree with me uh, we all have learned, especially myself, uh, have uh, learned immeasurable uh, knowledge and again, tremendous personal growth under his guidance. So for those who don't know Johannes well, he's not only a brilliant scientist, but also he's an exceptionally candid individual, radiating kindness and possessing a wonderful sense of humor. So without further ado, uh, let's congratulate Johannes for this word, deserved recognition, and let's warmly welcome him to the stage to give his award lecture titled, Advancing the Frontiers of Catalysis at Water Solid Interfaces. So, now, I need to try to start my computer because it went to rest. It tells me that I'm not connected. Thank you, Yong. Thank you, Gary, uh, for the way too kind words. Uh, thank you for those who confined me here at the podium because they had promised me a mic, but I didn't get it. Um, it's an honor, and it's a humbling moment when you are receiving an award in the name of Michel Boudar, who was not only a light and a beacon on which you could orient through the time, but also was a person who would always be approachable I would always try and help you in discussions to move on. Now, at the moment of uh, being grateful, I would like to, to also uh, remind and say who we have actually been, I've been blessed with working through a large number of students. And this is the group in Munich and I'm, uh, I really cherished all of them, even when we had a little bit more intense discussions on this. I've always also been uh, really happy to work uh, at PNNL, and it was a unique chance to broaden the horizon and being forced to work in between different forms of, thank you, that's fine, uh, in between different forms of, uh, the catalytic, the catalytic disciplines. I've listed on the left side collaborators, and I've singled out two. This was Heinrich Noller, who was my PhD advisor and gave me incredibly freedom uh, in actually to work whatever we wanted at that time, and to Gary Halle, who, who, who taught me that not everything can be as pampered as a, as a laboratory in Vienna, 
and that you have to wake up and to live to the realities of this world. And you see a long list of people, and the fact that the theoreticians are at the end of this list does not mean anything uh, on, on value, but really on more on the, on, on the way how we have uh, interacted on this one. You have on the right side those group leaders and senior scientists I, I had the pleasure to, to, to work with over the years. And, and, and again, I would like to single out Andreas. I would like to single out you and Hui Xi and Gabi Mirt as those who were the most influential one. And I would, at the end uh, of this list, uh, thank two friends that tried to put me back on the right path uh, in all aspects of my life and who regularly fail and still are friends. Uh, so so that, is, that is what I uh, what I'm really uh, appreciate. And at the end, the most important thing, and that's you, it's a community here and especially the North American community that the diversity, the diversity of opinions and the fact that you will walk out, 50% of the audience going out, what nonsense has Johannes talked today and how much do we disagree? But this disagreement is what shapes us. And this close-knit community is uh, what we really uh, should enjoy and should, should, should be living forward. It includes all ages, it includes, it's, I didn't see any other way of discrimination in, in, in that part and I can talk from my own experience as I'm a small minority in a small minority. Now let me start confusing you. I know that I shouldn't be doing it but I start with a molecule. And I start that this molecule has properties and we define these properties in Europe by, diff by a partial differentiation uh, to the free energy and call this chemical potential. And this chemical potential gives us the, the, the overall reactivity. It has two components in, that's the standard chemical potential, and if I talk to some of, this, is, this is, gives you the intensive property of that molecule. And the second part is the extensive property, and this may be an entropic term, but this may be simply the number. And then, when we start perturbing this system, we add something to it, and I call this the excess chemical potential, and this is called the excess chemical potential at least, uh, amongst the chemists, and that gives you all the contribution of the uh, environment, of the interactions, and what that molecule uh, has. Now, what's the consequence if we absorb? What's the consequence, and I'm using zeolites here, not because I think zeolite rule the world, but, but it's because it is a relatively well-defined structure in which we can uh, compare two states. And you have one here uh, where the state is in the, oh, uh, where the state is here in the gas phase and one where the state is, uh, is absorbed on the surface. We know already that, uh, that this describes the activity, the standard potential and the pressure. We know also that uh, if we are in equilibrium, the two chemical potentials in the gas phase and on the surface need to be the same, uh, need to be the same. And therefore, we can formulate the chemical potential of the adsorbed state, and that is, of course, the same standard potential then in the gas phase, and then we add excess potentials. We add the binding to the catalyst, and that gives you a gamma that is smaller than one, so it feels comfortable. It gives you interactions that can uh, that can be comfortable or that, and, and then it's smaller than one or they can be uncomfortable and repulsive and then it's larger than one. And uh, in all this, uh, we have one term that equilibrates this and that's the surface concentration. It's actually really concentrated or deconcentrating and that's all what I'm going to be talking about today. We have heard from Yuri as a, as a probe of measure how we can feel what the potential of this is. And this concentration at the surface gives us a GOG compared to the gas phase, what the, what the material, what the material uh, really, in which state the material is. Then it begins to be fairly simple because now you have a, a, a trajectory, a chemical path, and all what we are doing is we are looking to manipulate the initial states 
in the absorbed state or in the interacting state and the transition state. And now the, the binding to the surface gives us that trajectory and this is what we normally say when we talk about uh, the, the, the lowering of that barrier. And uh, clearly the concentration here is going to be higher than the concentration here. The excess chemical potential here in this state is much higher than, than, than here, so therefore the concentration is going to be much lower. We, all these changes are really only in the, uh, in the rate constant. And then we have a factor, the concentration of species at the surface on active site, that gives us the number of potential, uh, the concentration of transition states. We have two ways of manipulating both ground and transition states. In addition to the specific bonding and the nature of what we have, and that is the constrained environment that will help to stabilize, and that is the charge it, which may help to destabilize or to stabilize, depending whether the molecule is charged or not charged and what the polarity is. And that's all what I'm going to be talking today. I'm going to be talking, giving you three examples along this journey. Two of them are within zeolites. One of them is going to be on metal particles. We're talking about the local organization of water. We're going to be talking how the charge there will uh, destabilize and stabilize the, uh, the species along the reaction path. And I will talk finally how, we, how, how the binding of hydrogen to the metal is actually the only parameter for hydrogenation, so only for the hydrogen in, hydrogen out, which counts. Let's start with water. Now, if you absorb water in a zeolite, uh, like ZSM5, what you see, the amount of water that you can absorb and the isotherms, as you see it left here, depend on the concentration of aluminum in that lattice. And the more aluminum you have, the more uh, water you can absorb. And if you normalize those isotherms by the concentration of Brunsted acid sites, they all fall together. And that tells you that there is a specificity that is linked to the aluminum. You can then determine your stoichiometry, your stoichiometry and you will find that that stoichiometry is around seven to eight molecules. And you can, you can, once you have established this, you can then ask yourself, why is it limiting? And you will see that this limitation that you have is, I, I have to learn to, to, to handle an electronic pointer and without a light source, it's really difficult for me. Um, you see that, the, that, that this, uh, the heat of adsorption that you have decreases from around 75 kilojoules per mole, don't look at the, at the, the instationarity at the very beginning, from seven, down to 45 kilojoules per mole. And 45 kilojoules per mole is the heat of condensation of water. And after that enthalpy, it is less favorable for water to absorb inside the pores because you lose more entropy, you have, you have a, a, a larger spatial confinement, and it just absorbs and condenses outside. So what we, what we learn is, this is the barrier that actually hinders you of coming in. It's what, what determines hydrophobicity. So hydrophobicity is a colligative and entropic phenomenon. What happens if you make the pores larger? Well, if you have larger, you lose less entropy, you can have a, you can have a larger cluster, and you will see here that if you, I will show you this with beta, it's 10 water molecules instead of eight. But, and you can go on like this and I, we, will, we will discuss this as we move. The question is, we're talking about hydrophobicity. Does water really interact only with those Brunsted acid sites? For this, we took a step back. And this is work of Rishwe Sao uh, uh, here in the audience who, who, who literally looked calorimetrically on a series of alcohols, butanol, propanol, ethanol, methanol. And when you see this, uh, you will see that uh, they go regularly in a, linear, in a linear way down and they intercept uh, the y-axis at the value of around 35. And you see this intercept of 35 would correspond to the interaction of an OH group without, uh, without the carbon atom. Now, what do we learn from this? We learn from this that the interaction 
of uh, the each of the hydrocarbons is approximately 10 to 11, uh, 11 uh, kilojoules per mole. This is the slope of that, that we have. Every carbon atom adds the same amount. We know also that the OH group interacting with the wall is 35 kilojoules per mole. And this is surprisingly large uh, when you, and, and it's larger than the interaction of the CH group with the wall. So there is no need of the water molecule to really orient only to the uh, to, to itself. So this is not, there, there, are, there are clusters, but they're, uh, they're, loosely, they're loosely interacting. Now, we can, of course, make the proof of the pudding and absorb water in a silicolite in a ZSM5, the same structure, having no Brunson acid site, and indeed, it shows 33 kilocalories. That's, it's, it's, that's an agreement as good as it gets on calorimetry. That means we know that the interaction with water is fairly strong with the walls. And I asked my surface science friends and they were not surprised at all. But intuitively, we think about hydrophilic and hydrophobic interactions. Now, how much is a proton contributing to that interaction? And you see the same thing. You see a shift of that line. Again, the slope did not change. It's still the 11, 10 to 11 kilojoules per mole. You see now an additional 37 kilojoules per mole. Look, the difference is hardly there. And that means the interaction of this OH group with the uh, forming a hydronium ion at larger site is not much stronger than the interactions with the wall. So we have a little bit a, a, an illusion when we talk about hydrophilic and hydrophobic uh, interactions in this, in this way. And indeed, of course, the 70 kilojoules on extrapolation is exactly the value that we had found before for, the, uh, for water research. So the question comes on, why does only water fill the pores? And not, fill the, not, not fill the pores completely. Why does methanol fill all, all, all pores? And the answer is simply the heat of condensation. The interaction between the framework is 35 kilojoules per mole. The heat of condensation is 45 kilojoules per mole. If you do the same thing with methanol, the, the physisorption, the heat with the interaction, is 46 kilojoules per mole because now you have to add the carbon atom to this. The heat of condensation is only 35 kilojoules per mole. And therefore, methanol fills the pores. It's more advantages. Uh, water does not, and it's disadvantaged. OK. So we, have, we, we, we can work with this as a, 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 for the uniqueness of water in that sense and that there is no methanol phobicity or, or any other phobicity in, in, in lattices and interactions prevail in all of them. So what happens now? I have now positive charge in the zeolite. We have hydronium ions, we have hydrated hydronium ions. What happens if you absorb uh, a molecule in between them? Let us take a step back. Let us take first a step saying, what is the difference between gas phase and a liquid phase if we absorb on the same stuff? And I put the two examples here on the left side, the gas phase adsorption, and I've taken the example of cyclohexanol, and on the right side, the adsorption uh, in a solvent. And you see that the gas phase adsorption on this zeolite uh, here was 88 kilojoules per mole, and uh, we can therefore set this to 88 kilojoules per mole. What happens with the, with the, because of the much weaker adsorption in the aqueous phase, it's very simple. Yes, Charlie, you were right. Uh, it is a simple additive behavior uh, of uh, the enthalpy of solvation. And the, the, therefore, you start from a different starting point. You're already a lot lower. And therefore, the interaction with the surface is then only 22 kilojoules per mole. That helps if you need to adsorb and desorb. And it will help also if, you, if your desorption step is really something which is, very, which is very critical. Now, we may have changes, and you will see this, if the molecule is smaller and if the sorbent uh, changes its properties. The molecule is smaller is very important because if you have a large molecule, the dispersion forces and that, those, those diffuse interactions really tend to dominate, and therefore you will see much more subtle effects than if you go down to a small molecule like hydrogen, for example, or CO. Now, 
Let's go to the practice. Let's absorb a molecule, in this case phenol, into, into MFI. And you see, it's just the inverse what we had seen before. This is a water-filled uh, material, and the, the less hydronium ions or bronzed acid sites we have inside, the more molecules we can absorb. There are different slopes, even if you normalize those, and uh, there, is, there is fewer space where you, could, where you could absorb molecules. You're not separating those. You can do this for beta, and you can do this for MFI, and you see constantly you're not changing the hydronium size, uh, uh, hydrated hydronium size, you're adding an organic molecule into this. If you can, with small alcohol molecules, there may be some changes uh, where the alcohols itself would take part in the, in the hydration shell. How does that molecule react in this environment? This molecule experiences the same what a molecule would have in a, uh, in a strong electrolyte. And it's the same story that we have in salting out or salting in effects. When we are salt out, we're adding an electrolyte to, a, to an organic solution, to an organic mixture, and by adding the electrolyte, we begin to get a phase separation at one point. So what we're doing really in this phase separation is we're changing the excess chemical potential of that molecule. Because it's in equilibrium, eventually with the gas phase, we do not change the chemical potential. We only change the excess chemical potential. For those who love then standard chemical potentials, you can, of course, uh, define one for each of the states. But I save it for myself, and, and I would not like to confuse you even more on that, uh, on that formality. What is the consequence for this? The consequence is the more charge I'm having in, the closer that charge is, the higher the excess chemical potential is. And because we are equilibrated, that higher excess chemical potential leads to a lower concentration of absorbed species, a lower uh, interaction strength, a lower uh, equilibrium constant. We can formulate this, and we can formulate this as traditional uh, chemistry, uh, just traditional physical chemistry. You formulate this excess uh, chemical potential as an RT, and the so-called Sechenov constant and the ionic strength. And that's nothing else as what I've shown you here for the particular, for the particular ion strengths. And that's on top of the, of the change in excess potential, uh, the chemical potential that you, that you have done because you absorb it. The consequences, as you increase your ionic strength, your uh, equilibrium constant of that particular molecule, in this case cyclohexanol, goes down exponentially. Still smaller pores stabilize more, but also goes down exponentially. So we know uh, how to quantify these effects. What is the distance between those charges? And you will see that uh, they all peter off pretty much after one, uh, after one nanometer. So if you have, uh, in very dilute systems, you do not need to worry about, uh, about, this, uh, about these effects. And again, this does not count for, uh, for acetylite with hydroxy groups in the gas phase, because those are not ions. They, are not, they, they, they may be polarized, but they are not ions, and therefore uh, the adsorption heat under those conditions is constant with all uh, in, uh, independent largely of the concentration of Brunsted acid sites. Now let us, let us look at those, uh, what you can do uh, on this local chemistry, the stabilization in the pores and the, inf and the influence of the, of the proximity of the, uh, of the charge. I show you here the energy path for the dehydration of cyclohexanol. We see first the association, in this case here, with the Brunsted acid sites. We see the protonation here, the, the increase in that, in that part. We see the, the cleavage of the OH group, and we see finally the back donation of the proton back to the water cluster. And uh, in contrast to what we know from, uh, from gas phase studies, this latter step is more difficult because you now have to put back the proton to an uncharged water cluster and that, that actually constitutes the final, the final barrier and not the cleavage of the, of the carbon-oxygen bond. 
We know all this from in situ studies uh, done by, uh, by NMR spectroscopy and uh, Jian Si Hu, who has really pioneered that, uh, that technology, uh, has been a wizard in, 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 getting this, in getting this spectrum. We know the, the isotope effects and we know the exchange, the reversibility by the exchange uh, with oxygen. Now, what is the, how does the pore then stabilize it? The pore stabilizes the transition state quite drastically. So if we go from an open aqueous acid to the same concentration of protons per volume, we go to the zeolite, we have a much higher, and this is MFI, we have two orders of magnitude higher rate. We pay a little bit in entropy on this one, so we, we, we have a slight compensation, but there is, a huge, there is a huge positive effect of stabilizing the transition state. Now, uh, would more transition states make it better? How would that change? So the, the experiment that we've done on this one, we, we, we again took MFI, and we took an MFI in which we knew the effect in the gas phase of Brunsted acid sites was constant. We've done this, we've checked this in two reactions. We've checked this for uh, protolytic cracking, and we checked this for dehydration. No if impact of any differences in the Brunsted acid sites. If you do the same experiment in aqueous phase, what you would observe is a maximum in rate. Now, you could explain the first part here saying, OK, uh, your Brunsted acid site concentration, as it goes up, you increase the initial state uh, of that molecule. We don't know yet what the, what the transition state does, and we will see that the transition state is actually equally uh, and, and even more positively influenced. But then it decreases again. And I will try to answer this before, but I, I'm, uh, afterwards, but I'm telling you in advance that, that it has to do with a rearrangement in the pores, in a confines where you have to do a charge separation between that salts and that costs you additional energy, and that, that, that sort of does not allow you to, to, uh, to go up in uninfinitely. It's not a singularity. You can do the same thing by increasing the ionic strength in the liquid. And here we have done the same dehydration. In, in, in an aqueous solution, we have changed. This is a, a constant hydronium ion concentration induced by HCl, and we have changed the ionic strength only by, uh, by adding additional sodium chloride. So we changed it on a neutral basis. We didn't change the pH. You see there is a, an almost linear increase in this one. So we know both the transition state and the, uh, the, uh, the charge help us in order to increase the reaction rate. And because this is a little bit an order of magnitude smaller than this, we know that they are approximately equally contributing at this one. So the, the, the impact of the ionicity and the impact of the, uh, of, the, of the space are approximately the same. So this is the case when we, when we work this in ideal conditions. So if we work it in a very dilute situation, if we work it in uh, the present situation with a high ionic strength in the zeolite pores, we see two things. We see that, uh, that yes, the ground state has in, uh, is higher, so the initial state is higher here, yes, but also the positive charge uh, before the transition state stabilizes uh, the, the intermediate, so also the transition state comes. And the detailed analysis helps you a little bit because you can independently estimate the excess chemical potential in the initial state and the excess chemical potential in the transition state. And if you look at the numbers here, you will see that's almost a factor of four more impact on the transition state than on the initial state. This, I, I would be very careful for more complex reactions to, 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 to extrapolate this, but it tells, us, it tells us where we were. Now, you could go out and say, Johannes, you're working under conditions where you have constraints, and you simply cannot, you simply add more hydronium ions and you cannot bring in more molecules, that's why your denominator increases and your nominator uh, stays constant, and that's why the whole curve falls down. And so therefore, we went back and said, okay, we have to work under conditions where we are in first order. So we work under very dilute conditions, 
under those uh, things, and we have a very small concentration of uh, alcohol molecules in. That's the result. We still go through a maximum. And the question comes now, what is that maximum doing and why do we have this maximum? And the answer is, is a little bit less obvious than, than, than what, what we may all have thought in the beginning. You know, and I've, I've shown you this, there is a difference between the two charges that we have in here. And when we talk it with MFI, we see that it's approximately the same, uh, that, that distance it, the maximum is at the distance when that, that distance is approximately the same as the diameter of the pores. And indeed, you would be tempted to say when I go now to Zeolite Beta, I see the shift is to the right, and indeed this is what we see. So the maximum in Beta is, is 0.67, the maximum in MFI is 0.55. I will put this in, in, in question. So what does this shift do? Now let me let me put the, the, the hypothesis in, and the hypothesis is simply is once the transition state and once that symmetry gets larger than the transition state, all what we have to do is we have to separate the positive and the negative charge in the zeolite, and that adds additional work. And that additional work uh, uh, sort of works towards uh, increasing, your, or, or, uh, increasing your transition uh, free energy. We can do the same thing. This is not a singularity for elimination reactions. We can do the same thing for an aldol condensation. And we'll see an increase in that aldol condensation. Here already at lower ionic strengths, and we see a strong increase uh, with, with HCl as well. However, again, the rates are much lower. The rates are two orders of magnitude lower outside the zeolite pores than inside the zeolite pores. And the transition state is uh, further to the right. Because now I need have two molecules. I need, a larger, I need a larger environment. And indeed, what we learn is we learn uh, that in this particular case here, MFI for the elimination was the best. In this case, for, uh, for aldol condensation, beta is the best. This is what we know. We know that we have our benefit of the environment. And we have a limitation by the pore size and by the symmetry. We don't know. This is really an open, this is really an open question. So the constrained space helps and limits at the same time. If this is true, if I'm opening up the surface, if I'm going to macro pores, that should go away. And that should be changed by the fact that all what I need to do then is I need to do have a little volume expansion. So I have a volume expansion of my Helmholtz layer that is very little work compared to a charge separation. Indeed, this is what we've done. So we've compared tungstated uh, surfaces from alumina to carbon, and we could change the concentration of hydronium ions. This was Nicholas Prem in collaboration with Gary Haller's work here. We could change that, that surface that, that surface volume, and by changing that surface volume, you can estimate the concentration and the average distance of the protons that you have in that, in that environment. The larger the average distance is, uh, the lower is your rate. The higher, this is a log scale, the, high, the smaller, the, the shorter the distance is, the more protons you have in that soup, uh, the, 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 higher, the higher the rate is. And that puts us now in a, in, in a situation where we, we can begin to describe and begin to predict. And I've done this in one case for, a, for a, the simple reaction of, of the alcohol dehydration that we had seen before. You see here on the, a, on the one axis here, the chemical potential or the excess chemical potential of the transition state. So we have manipulated this. We go higher in this case. As we go higher, our rate goes down in that, in that uh, turnover frequency. Here, we change the, the, the chemical potential of the, adsorbed, of the adsorbed state, making it higher, less stable on the surface. The rate goes up. And now we have a plane in this three-dimensionality that helps us to predict this was the curve that I'd shown you before for MFI, 
This is the curve I've shown you, or I've not shown you for beta. This is the point for phagocyte. And the, the, the dots and the line that you see in would be the same concentration of Brunsted acid sites in that, in that environment. So we slowly really approach a situation where uh, we can begin to predict and to model how high catalytic activity could go. Of course, this is, a, this is not trivial. This was a lot of work for a simple reaction, and there are a lot of reactions out there. So, so this is not, but with the help of computing, with the help of theory, this could, this could really pave the way and could help us. I am uh, particularly proud because uh, we had made a prediction. And we had made a prediction that uh, in order to de depolymerize an alkane or to crack an alkane, we needed to couple an endothermic and an exothermic reaction. In the endothermic and the exothermic reaction that we coupled was a standard cracking, not a protolytic cracking, a carbenium ion cracking, and alkylation. So in both cases, carbenium ion chemistry dominates. And uh, the way we generate those carbenium ions is with a trick. We put in, uh, in a tertiary butyl chloride as a, as, as, as a, a starting agent in order, to, in order to do this, not in order to, to, have, to have a too long uh, initiation period. Now, we, we, we work in this, so we made, we used aluminum chloride as a catalyst. We disguised, because it's of the easier handling, the aluminum chloride in an ionic liquid. And the ionic liquid provides a highly, a strong ionic environment. And this strong ionic environment now helps us to increase rates. And so we have done both. We have allowed for coupling, through the coupling, to lower the temperature and avoid the endotomicity by, by a kinetic coupling. And we have increased the rates by providing the molecule an unpleasant environment, the ionic, the ionic liquid and the high ionicity. And what you see is the conversion of LDPE. This is Wei Zhang's, these are Wei Zhang's experiments. So where we took LDPE, you can take any form of polyethylene, polypropylene, it doesn't matter. Um, in any mixture, and you take isopentane, you take it with a tertiary butyl, uh, sorry, with an N-butyl uh, pyridinium ion and aluminum chloride, and you get out 100% yield of uh, a mixture of liquid alkanes at 70 degrees. So uh, you could go a little bit lower, but, but, but actually at some point you really run into the thermodynamic limitations and your conversion is not going to be, is not going to be complete. So this is, the, this, this, this is the point. So what I wanted to show and what I want to emphasize is, yes, this was a lot of heavy and very simple chemistry and physical chemistry. Hey, no, you can actually use this and convert this to practice. Now let me... Let me, over the last third, let me go through a change pace. I've shown you so far, I've shown you uh, solid acids and how the, hydronium ions, uh, how the hydronium ions work. And I would like to, to, to point out then now how we add hydrogen to molecules under those conditions. And there is a lot of debate of whether this hydrogen is being added, uh, whether electrocatalytically or catalytically, as a hydrogen atom on the surface, or it is a, a proton coupled electron transfer. And I will show you that this proton coupled electron transfer and the ionic, yes, they differ, but at the end, eventually, there's a gradual from the rate, there's a very gradual uh, a transition between, the, between those two. Now, if we, if we put a metal particle like platinum in water, what we observe is a lot uh, weaker adsorption. And you would come back and tell me, yes, you have shown before that this weaker adsorption is because of the stabilization of, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the molecule in the solvent. Um, yes, this is true to a large part, but no, it's not true. There is always a, there, there is still a barrier, there's still a barrier left. And the question, 
arises, why do we have a, a change not only in a, uh, in a lower entropy that, that we are having, but we also have a higher entropy. So we, we actually gain in entropy uh, under those conditions in water compared to the, uh, uh, or we have higher entropy loss in water despite the weaker, the weaker interaction. When we look at platinum, platinum in the gas phase has a work, uh, has a work function of 5.6 eV. And if we look this to the standard hydrogen electrode, pH zero, one bar hydrogen, uh, 25C, we have a, a work function of approximately of 4.4 eV. So we have two different work functions. And now the question is, a, do these work functions equilibrate? And they equilibrate if the number of electrons that I have in the one pool and the number of, uh, of redox potentials I have in the other pool, uh, whoever dominates will dominate in this, in, in this, in this chemistry. And you see this, this is a very nice, uh, of uh, an EPFL group that had done a very nice uh, a review article on this and shown that uh, you do have, when you take a particular redox potential, in this case, the water, if that lies higher, you will do start donating into that, into that system because you have a finite metal particle. Finite metal particle is one, two nanometer size of that metal particle. So we, what, we, what we know is we change the Fermi level. Uh, we change that Fermi level if we keep the vacuum level constant. If we change the vacuum level, there, is, there, there are different things that we, can, that we can observe. And there may be different reasons for that, uh, for that, uh, for that transition. But we know that the two will, uh, will in some ways uh, eventually uh, equilibrate. And you can measure that equilibration by measuring the open circuit potential if you, if you put your, your, your electrode into water. Why is, what, why is a hydrogen then weaker bound? It's, it's weaker bound because, uh, because your higher Fermi level or your higher level compared to hydrogen will then give you a, a stronger feeling of the antibonding anti states. Now, if that's the case, we know that uh, a higher concentration, uh, a lower pH, a higher concentration of hydronium ions weakens typically hydrogen binding. If we do this, and if we make the, the, electro the electrochemistry, we see that, uh, that actually you would observe at the lower pH, you should observe a higher hydrogen binding energy because you have a higher level. And that's not the case. It's just the opposite. Stronger binding at weaker pH. So we know that this model, simply by filling and by shifting this with pH, uh, does not work. What is different? Different is that we have to have an additional factor in, and that additional factor is the work that we need to do to separate the first layer from the metal surface. So if we insert into that adsorption, if we insert hydrogen into adsorption, a higher concentration of hydronium ions in the Helmholtz layer would, uh, would require more work, and that would weaken eventually the total, uh, the total energy that we, are, that, that we are observing. And indeed, theory uh, here uh, shows you that, that uh, we, we, we do get a larger, a larger distance. Can we, can we manipulate this with, uh, with, external, uh, with external potentials? Yes, we can. We can add an external potential we add a positive potential, we drag it down, and therefore, and therefore the binding gets stronger. Still, within the different pH, you still have the same differentiation. So we can manipulate that binding by adding positive or negative potential on the, uh, on, on the metal. This is where, how, we can, how we can then manipulate the relative binding of hydrogen. Now, uh, the question that arises is, does it matter? And I've shown you, and I would not tell you the story if it would not matter. Uh, I've shown you on the one side that the molecules are experiences an extreme high density close in that Helmholtz layer. 
So there is a change in the initial and the final state of the, those molecules in binding. And there is a difference in the hydrogen binding in particular. I will give you first the reason why this matters on a simple example that we had done together with Cathy Chin when she was on sabbatical in Munich uh, on the hydrogenation of uh, benzaldehyde uh, here on, on that surface. And that hydrogenation occurs in, in a very simple way of there are two pathways, the alkoxy and the hydroxy pathway. I've only show you here the hydroxy pathway, but it, it is really the addition of hydrogen on that surface going to, to, that, to that part. And this shows an extreme strong dependence on water, methanol, uh, and polar and apolar solvents. And the reason is, why does, it, why does it show it? And I'll show you here the two, the two things. Let us first look at the adsorption of benzaldehyde on that surface. Yes, benzaldehyde adsorbs very differently on these surfaces in the different solvents. But the distance to the transition state stays all the same. The same in, in, in dissimilar, if, I'm, if, if we're looking now to the binding of hydrogen, the weaker hydrogen is bound to that surface, the higher the, the delta G standard difference is. So uh, in, in dioxane, the, the distance is much larger than in methanol. And therefore, methanol is orders of magnitude more reactive than, 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 than dioxin. And that all means hydrogen is much weaker bound. Why is this the case? It's very simple. The transition state of, yes, this molecule is differently bound, but the transition state is so similar to the initial state that all the changes are being leveled out and the two are, they are compensating each other. While hydrogen is really done from one state into the next, and therefore, uh, all the differences will, will be accounted for. Can we change proton coupled electron transfer to, uh, to hydrogen addition? Yes, we can. We only need to change the, uh, the pH. We need to change the probability that the proton is there. It, it helps, and we can do this. We can show you, and I'm not going to bore you with the uh, with the details on the hydrogen deuterium exchange, but you see exactly the deuteration effects that at pH 2, it is water that plays a role, and it, at high pH, it is the hydrogen or deuterium that plays a role. And we see that over uh, three orders of magnitude in change of the hydronium ion concentration, yes, we lose a factor three or four. So that's not totally impressive. It's a lot more impressive if you go into a zeolite where the changes are much smaller, but these smaller changes are then, uh, are then uh, shown both in, this is between a platinum silicolite, where we do have hardly hydronium ions in, and a platinum MFI, where we have a quite large concentration of hydronium ions, and we have approximately a factor of four or five, but here the concentration change is much, much lower. So yes, we can, change this, we can change if there is a localized concentration of hydronium ions. The same thing works, by the way, if you functionalize carbon supports. Theory, this was uh, from the group of Matt Nurok, was actually showing that, that indeed a higher acidity and that at higher hydronium ion concentration makes the, the proton coupled electron transfer favorable and, and helps us to, 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 achieve, to achieve that size. So we have solved the subtle differences between proton addition and hydrogen addition. Now let me come to the last point, and this is, can we manipulate rates on a non-Faradaic way by changing the external potential? This is work that has been presented yesterday by Julia Moreira uh, from PNNL. And she showed that what you do is, this is hydrogenation, again, the infamous benzaldehyde molecule that we seem to hydrogenate uh, with, with great enthusiasm. This is electrochemistry. This is, just adding, uh, this is just adding hydrogen pressure between 5 and 20 bar. If you add an external potential, this is minus 0.1 against the reversible hydrogen electrode, you see 
a significant jump in activity. And you see a significant difference in the order in which it's, in which it's done. And now you can take a step back and can say, OK, I know my current. So because I know my current, I can, I can estimate how many electrons I have actually used to hydrogenate. And I take that extreme case and say I have 100% Faradaic efficiency. All my electrons went into that molecule. And this is what you get out, the yellow curve. And that yellow curve shows you immediately it just doesn't get it. It just does not cut it quite to the same level as you've seen in this. And uh, the consequence of this is that we have a residual which is actually done by changing the metal. Now you could say, yes, you change the metal partially to a higher hydrogen concentration in palladium. This was the catalyst in this. And you do a weaker bonding because hydrogen binds to palladium hydride weaker than is done before. Same topic. I'm weakening the bonding of hydrogen in that molecule. I'm having an external knob how, to, how we tune this and how we, can, how we can play this. And this is it. So I've started out today explaining you that uh, we have a local organization. I've shown you that this local organization defies a little bit what we think about how hydrogen bonds and hydrogen not bonds. I'm also encouraging you, everything is normalized to the gas phase pressure. So if you, if you fix your gas phase pressure and you wait long enough, you can determine your thermodynamic state by determining your, con your local concentration. You know the sum of your gammas, and all what you need to do is you need to work out your gammas. This is complex, but if we work all together, we can, we can actually solve that complexity. I've shown you that the interactions with the hydrophobic wall with OH groups are at least as strong as uh, the interactions of an OH group with the hydrophilic side. I've shown you that in the next step that there is an interaction that Bringing charge together changes the initial state of a molecule. And I can do this in very simple electrostatic models, and I can take a section of constant, I, take in, I can take the ionic strength, and actually estimate where this, where this gets us. And I've shown you also that as soon as I need to get charge separation, I, am, uh, I, I, need, to, I need to pay for this. And I, as soon as I'm making it open, I will lose this, this compartmentalization that I've been, uh, I've been showing you before in the first step. And on the last step, I've shown you some ways how to manipulate and change hydrogen binding. And hydrogen, weaker hydrogen binding always increases the rate constant. It not always increases the rate, because at some point there is such a weak interaction that you don't have it and you need very high pressures. But you can. You can estimate and you can come forward and do this. I've said thank you initially to all the people I had the pleasure and the privilege to work with. I, I want to say thank you for those who have helped that we could work with and that, that done the sponsoring. I have, uh, would like to single out here the US Department of Energy. I would like to single out the European Union and DFG and both of my host institutions that have been tolerant enough to endure me for quite a while.